Uh, it's uh, last week was International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So this is a good uh, panel to commemorate that and, and think uh, deeply about the issues it brings up during the Holocaust as well as memory of the Holocaust. Before we get started, um, I'm Yael Aronoff, the director of the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel, and I just wanted to let you know about our next uh, Holocaust-related event, which will be on February 22nd on Tuesday from 5.30 to 7 in the James Madison College Library, which is on the third floor of Case Hall. Uh, if you're not, you'll, you'll start, if you're on our email list, serve, you'll, you'll get uh, more information and reminders about that uh, the week before. So it'll be in person, but it'll also be live streamed. If you're not on our email list and would like to be, uh, look at the chat and we'll have information on how you can join our email list. Uh, we'll have information for students about if you'd be interested in the Jewish Studies minor about uh, contacting me at aronoffy at msu.edu. Um, and also we encourage you to look at our website, jsp.msu.edu uh, under the student tab. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, we have classes on the history of the Holocaust, on antisemitism, Jews and antisemitism, on American Jewish history and on European Jewish history uh, that cover um, some of these uh, different aspects of this topic if you're interested in learning more. Uh, so let's get started for this evening. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Ben Yoel, who is a graduate student in the Political Science Department, for the initiating this panel and through all three of our esteemed panelists. I'll introduce our two um, core faculty from the Serling Institute. Uh, so first, and, and before, and I also like to thank our co-sponsors, so don't want to forget about that, uh, which is, are the James Madison College, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the College of Arts and Letters, the College of, so of Social Science, um, the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion, um, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, uh, and the Political Science Department, and the Department of History. So thank you for supporting and co-sponsoring this event today. Um, so i first uh, like to introduce Amy Simon, Professor Amy Simon. She's our Farber Chair in Holocaust Studies and European Jewish um, History at MSU. She teaches in James Madison College and in the Department of History and in the Michael E. Lane Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies. Uh, she was a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial uh, uh, Museum in Washington, DC, and she held a Leon Millman Memorial Fellowship for research um, there. She regularly gives public lectures on Holocaust history, diaries, and pedagogy for academic and lay audiences. Her work on Holocaust fiction, memoir, diaries, and pedagogy has appeared in Holocaust Studies, the Journal of Culture and History, Jewish Historical Studies, the Journal of Jewish Identities, and a number of edited volumes. She's also doing a lot of workshops on anti-Semitism on campus, so you may have an opportunity to, to hear her at one of those. We're offering another three this spring. Um, I'd also like to introduce Professor Kirsten Vermeglish, Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Michigan State uh, University. Her most recent book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, A History of Jewish Name Changing in America, was awarded the Saul Wiener Book Prize by the American Jewish Historical Society in June 2019. Uh, she is the author of American Dreams and Nazi Nightmares, Early Holocaust Consciousness and Liberal America from 1957 to 1965, and the co-editor of the Norton Critical Edition of Betty Friedan, The, Femin the Feminine Mystique with Lisa Fine. From 2016 to th through 2021, she was co-editor of the journal American Jewish History with Daniel Sawyer and Adam Mendelson. Uh, Dr. Vermeglish has published articles on anti-Semitism at Michigan State University in the 1930s and um, in the United States in the 1940s and in 2001 to 2003, she worked as a curator for the MSU Museum exhibit, Uneasy Years, Michigan Jury and Depression and War. Her current research focuses on the migration of Jewish academics to college towns throughout the South and Midwest in the years after World War II. And she's also been very involved um, in our continued um, trainings for residential advisors and workshops on anti-Semitism at MSU. So thank you to both of you. And Ben, you'll have the honor of uh, introducing um, the professor in political science department, uh, Dr. Anna Brackick. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aronoff. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Anna Bracic, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Michigan State University, and she's also a member of the Minority Politics Initiative at MSU. Uh, her research is primarily in the field of comparative politics, and she focuses on questions of human rights, discrimination, the persistence of social exclusion, and ground level effectiveness of human rights institutions, such as NGOs. Most of her research relies on lab and field and survey experiments, 
And in order to gather data from severely underrepresented populations, such as the Roma in East Central Europe, uh, Dr. Bracic uses innovative approaches to measurements such as video games. Well, thank you. This should be a, a really, I know I all learn a great deal from you all this evening. If anyone has any questions, please write them in the Q&A. Uh, each speaker will speak for 20 minutes and then we'll have question and answer and discussion. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Amy Simon for, for starting us off. All right, thank you so much. Um, welcome, I'm just thrilled that there are so many people here. Um, is one of the you know silver linings of you know of COVID, and you know we made this go online because we knew that the university was shut down just until last week um, in terms of in-person activities and classes. Um, and of course, now with the snow, um, probably this would have been canceled otherwise. So I really um, am thrilled to still have the opportunity to do this and to have so many people, um, which Zoom kind of allows us to do in new ways. Um, so what I'm going to do today is. So I'm a historian of the Holocaust, right? And obviously I spent a whole semester teaching Holocaust history and uh, even still it's heartbreaking the things I have to leave out, right? Because the history, even just of this, you know, 12 year period is so uh, intense, um, rich. It involves so many millions of people across so many different countries and even continents. Um, so it's impossible to talk about everything. Um, so what I've decided to do today is really to organize my talk around five major misconceptions uh, about the Holocaust, right? Rather than giving you a whole history, which I can't do. And these are misconceptions uh, as, as I perceive them based on my teaching and, um, and, and public lectures to lay audiences, right? Things that if you're not necessarily a Holocaust expert or if you haven't taken a class, particularly in the Holocaust, you may not be as familiar with or something some things that you might have thought that aren't exactly true, although we'll see there, there are relationships between, you know, truth and the kind of common narratives that get told about the Holocaust. So I'm going to share my screen, post disabled screen sharing. And I would like for a host to allow me to share my screen, please. All right, here we go. All right. So. Okay. All right, so first what I have is a definition of the Holocaust. It is a definition of the Holocaust. There are many definitions of the Holocaust. In my classes, we talk about definitions of the Holocaust. It, um, is, like I said, such a broad event that happened uh, to so many people in so many places and spans such a long period of time. And also, you know, since the war has, you know, meant different things in history, in our public imagination, in different places, in politics. It's just a constantly changing event, even though it's something that we know happened and we, you know, have so much, uh, you know, distinct information, but what we do with that information, how we think about it, it is always changing. And so this is the most recent definition as of today from the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And so I'll read it to you and then I'll say something interesting um, and something that surprised me about it, even though I'm the one that's supposed to be telling you things that are surprising to you. Okay, so the Holocaust was the systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of 6 million European Jews by the Nazi German regime and its allies and collaborators. The Holocaust was an evolving process that took place throughout Europe between 1933 and 1945. So I can tell you as a historian that these words are all chosen very specifically to, to mean a specific thing. I am not going to go through every single word and, and explain uh, why it was chosen, but the thing that I wanted to mention that surprised me is that this definition of the Holocaust only includes the murder of 6 million European Jews. Um, and so we know, and our next speaker will talk about another victim group, another very important victim group, the Roma, and there were other victim groups as well. And, and why I was surprised by this is that when I worked at the Holocaust Museum first in 2000 and one, I um, 
the definition at that moment uh, included all the victim groups and said 6 million European Jews and 5 million others. And it gave some, some examples like Roma, disabled, um, Slavs, political prisoners, so, and homosexuals. So it's very interesting to me that that's not there anymore. I don't know the story, a lot of it's politics. Um, but so for, for this purpose, the Holocaust Museum today says 6 million European Jews. The museum itself talks about all kinds of other victim groups like the ones I just mentioned. Um, and then it also now includes allies and collaborators, which it did not include in uh, 20 years ago. And the other new thing that surprised me was this um, comment that it was an evolving process, which of course is true, um, but is not, uh, has not traditionally been uh, part of a like official definition. And then it has between 1933 and 1945. 1933 is the year that Hitler became chancellor and 1945 is the end of World War II. Um, but some people put this at 1939 with the start of World War One. I. I mean, sorry, World War II. So, you know, all of this um, is up for discussion, but this works for me actually pretty well because I will be talking about Jews uh, for my uh, talk right now. And there's two reasons why. One, I'm a Jewish studies professor. So I have traditionally studied the Holocaust from a Jewish perspective. I write about Jewish diaries, Yiddish diaries um, written during the Holocaust. So it's very much a Jewish perspective, but also because um, within the Nazi ideology, although so many other groups of people were targeted and murdered and persecuted in various ways, the Jews were the one victim group, the one group of people that were really considered the, the crux of Nazi ideology. Hitler believed that the world was set up between the Aryans and the Jews, and that what Germany was facing in the 1930s was um, a potential fight to the death between Germans and Jews, and only one could win. And that would, the death and the, the murder of every Jew would mark the salvation of Germany. That was very particular to the Jewish people. So there is something central about um, Jews in the Holocaust, aside from you know, just the massive numbers, which of course, um, dwarf any other single group. All right, so the first um, one of these misconceptions that I'll talk about is the idea that Hitler was elected chancellor. Hitler was never elected chancellor. He was never elected to anything in Germany. The Nazi party um, in 1932 had approximately 30% of the vote. That's not insignificant. It is not a majority. It was not enough um, to you know, carry an entire government. This was a coalition government. It was a democracy and it was very unstable. There were very many political groups and Nazism was just one of them. The Nazi party was just one and Hitler was the head of the party. And the reason I include this picture here is because this is a propaganda poster um, in 1934 and, the, um, and this all, all of my images and things from today um, come from the Holocaust Museum website. Um, the text on the poster says, yes, leader, we follow you. And you see the adoring masses, right, with their arms um, up in the, in the Hitler salute. And this was so prominent um, from before Hitler had any power until Hitler was um, um, given the chancellorship, right? Not elected chancellor. He lost the presidential election in 1932. He was given the chancellorship um, in order for the coalitions um, to try to gain support um, from, from, you know, 30% of the population who voted for him. But he was by no means um, the only popular leader. He by no means did the majority of Germans uh, vote for Hitler, want Hitler, like Hitler, right? Um, that, that's just not accurate. And so the, prop, the propaganda here that he used and you know, Joseph Goebbels, his, um, his propaganda minister used to um, uh, you know, garner support really pushed the narrative that everybody loves Hitler, everybody so, you know, adores Hitler, which is why there are so many examples of these like masses of people. Um, and then, you know, he used these, you know, traditional, um, typical fascist techniques of mass rallies and mass organizations to, um, you know, get the masses of people behind him. Later, after 1934, the death of the then president, Paul, Hinberg, Paul von Hindenburg, after that, um, you know, Hitler was getting like 99% of the vote, but by then it was coerced, right? It, it wasn't a true uh, mark of the will of the German people. All right, second one, there were lots of Jews in Germany. And I think that people probably think this because if you're looking at Nazism and the Holocaust logically, 
you would think, well, you know, if Hitler thought it was a fight to the death between Jews and Germans, um, weren't there must have been a lot of Jews, right? They must have had a lot of power. They must have, you know, somehow seemed like a threat. But um, the, it's actually the opposite of the truth. Um, and so this map here shows you the populations of Jews throughout Europe uh, in 1933. And in Germany in 1933, there were 565,000 Jews. That was less than one half of 1% 1 of the population of Germany. Not 1%, less than one half of 1% of the population of Germany. This was a tiny minority. In all of Central and Western Europe, this was a tiny minority of people in each of the countries. And even in Poland, which had the largest um, percentage of Jews, uh, Jews in Poland, made there were 3 million Jews, and they made up about 10% of the population. So that's a, a large minority, but it's still quite a minority, right? And almost everybody else um, was Catholic, so about 90% Catholic and about 10% Jewish. So, you know, we really have uh, something that's really out of proportion, right? That Hitler really much, very much believed in a conspiracy theory of Jewish power that was completely disjointed from reality. All right, the next one we have is Jews in Germany were considered white just like other Jews. And this is something we spend a lot of time in, in my classes because I think it's hard, and we see this with the, the recent comments by Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg, for example, that it's really hard in you know, the United States in 2022 to go back and to remember a, a different place, a different time, and you know, to contextualize something historically, which is of course what I'm always trying to do. And so I have this image here because I think it tells you better than I ever could um, or shows you better than I could in words, how, how Germany really considered Jews not only a racial other, but the racial other. Like I said, the epitome of anti-German and Aryan, right? So the, the Nazis had this whole idea of, um, of race that was based on a fictionalized version of an Aryan master race, that made up the majority of Germany, and then others, um, which again, central to that was the idea of Jews as an other. And this form of racial anti-Semitism that took place in Germany had been growing since the 19th century. It was founded in Germany in the 19th century, these ideas of Jews as racial others. And what I mean by racial others is very specifically that they believed that Jews had racial components. They were born biologically different from Aryans. And there was nothing they could do. There was something in their blood that was inferior and there was nothing they could do to change it. It was completely about their, their race, which was seen as anathema to the Aryan race. Um, and so what we have here is this poster from 1938 and it's, it's comparing the German youth to the Jewish youth. And it's showing you the racial features, right? The physical features that separate out the master race, the Aryans, and the subhuman Jewish race. Um, and it says, um, you know, the, the quote at the bottom here says, um, from the face speaks the soul of the race. Okay, so they were using the term race. They, they meant it biologically, and they believed that you could determine by looking at somebody whether they were Jewish or Aryan. And so you have you know, the Jews with the droopier eyes and the larger nose, you have to have the side view, right, to see the large nose and the dark hair versus, right, the Aryan kids that have the small nose and the, you know, blue eyes, unfortunately, and most of these were in black and white, but um, blue eyes and, you know, light colored hair, um, and so look radically different from these inferior Jews. Um, so this is very much a part, a central part of the ideology and, um, and there were other groups, right? There were Black people in Germany. They were a teeny tiny, if the Jews were a small minority, uh, the Black people were even smaller minority. They were persecuted, um, but they just weren't central to the Nazi program. They were, you know, there were other people considered, um, you know, inferior, disabled people, for example, um, homosexual people, um, all considered inferior, but again, not central to the Nazi ideology, although they were all persecuted under this great banner of racial hygiene or cleansing the race, like eugenics, right? Cleansing the race of all badness, including um, Jews. 
Judaism. All right, the next one I have is, okay, wait, wait. Oh, I was gonna give you a warning. The next um, two pictures have some graphic, um, graphic, uh, they are of graphic nature. All right, so the next one is that the Holocaust took place in death camps like Auschwitz and the killing was industrialized and impersonal. Well, yes, of course this is true, right? Um, and so you have two pictures here. We have the picture, the kind of um, standard picture of Auschwitz. This is actually Birkenau, which is the part of Auschwitz that had the gas chambers and, um, and the crematoria. And here's the railway you know, going into Auschwitz. And um, it's true, right? 1.1 million people were killed in Auschwitz. It's, it boggles the mind, right? This enormous, enormous number of people. But it's also important to note that before Auschwitz and other death camps even started, um, there was mass killing on the level of 2 million people um, going on in Eastern Europe, so east of Poland, um, in what was then, you know, lots of areas of the Soviet Union, including places like, you know, Russia, Ukraine, um, Lithuania today, that, that, you know, are those countries today. Um, there were, and so what would happen is the German military would go in, and as they took over a town, the Einsatzgruppe, which was a special group, basically, um, came in after them, and their job was to murder the commissars. Who were commissars? Well, they were defined as um, communist, you know, Russian communist leaders, the political leaders, and Jews. And eventually it became men, women, and children. Um, and so as part of this order, um, starting in the summer of 1941, before any of the death camps um, were, were operational, people were being killed by the tens of thousands all over Eastern Europe in just shot into pits. And here's an example of Babi Yar. Um, this was in a ravine outside of um, Kiev in what is now Ukraine. And um, 33,000 mainly Jews were killed over the course of two days in September of 1941. This is one of the, the biggest, but also just one of thousands of mass murders like this that took place throughout Europe. So what I wanna say is that it's not only the camps and why it matters is that there's this idea of like the industrialized killing, right? That this was a bureaucracy and it was faceless and it was, no, if you're shooting people off the side of a ravine um, and you know, to be graphic again, you know, there's literally the blood and the brains of people you shot are on you that, there's absolutely nothing impersonal about that. And so it's important to remember that in thinking about who the perpetrators were and what they were, you know, what they were up to. All right, I have one last one. And so this one is also, I think, something that we probably all know in terms of common sense, but this doesn't get talked about that much in, um, in really, <laughs> the vast majority of venues that the Holocaust gets talked about. It doesn't get talked about so much in pop culture, in classes, even in my, right, I'm guilty. Even in my Holocaust history class, we very, very briefly talk on, uh, talk about what happened after the war, um, just because there's so much to talk about from 1933 until 45. So I'm here to tell you a few words about it. So the fallacy or the, you know, uh, idea is that after the war, Jews went to the United States or they went to Israel and they lived happily ever after. It, you know, would that it were true. Those of you in my senior seminar know that um, it's not true. We, we've been doing reading the last two weeks actually about this. Um, and so what I have here in the middle is a picture of survivors, you know, recently liberated from the Buchenwald concentration camp. And I put this here because you can see um, their physical state, right? And we're all familiar with these photos, but I want you to think about what it actually means to be in that physical state and then to have to recover from that, right? And the reality is you don't snap your fingers and, and are recovered. People took years, even with good medical care after the end of the war and food and a warm place to be and you know medicine and, and clean sheets and whatnot. It took years for many people to recover their health and some people never did. And some people died when they were 40 because of you know uh, treatments and, and malnutrition and things they had undergone during the war. Um, so physically, and then of course, psychologically, right? Which you can't really get a picture of, but ultimately um, I think it's really impossible. And it was very unique to the Jewish survivors that um, they had nothing to go back to, right? Most people had lost everything. 
every friend, every family member. Um, and, and so psychologically, it's impossible, I think, for, for hopefully for us, definitely for me, to understand um, the repercussions of that. And again, that it didn't go away, right? Uh, the, the psychological trauma did not go away, certainly not right away. And then here I have a picture. This is from the um, Betzlar uh, Displaced Persons Camp. So after the war, about 250,000 Jewish displaced persons um, were throughout Germany. Um, and they were in allied zones, allied zones where there were displaced persons camps. And these camps, um, you know, you can see the picture, left a lot to be desired. So even if you manage to, you know, start to recover your health from this and have enough, you know, um, wherewithal to move forward and, you know, try to start rebuilding your life, uh, the situation people were in was not good. Um, and it was not easy uh, to live in these camps, which continued to be camps, even though people were just liberated from camps. And it's a whole other long story that, that's very complicated, but I thought this picture did a good job of just showing how difficult the circumstances were. And then finally, it wasn't that easy for people to find a place to go, right? So survivors couldn't necessarily go home. Um, and they tried mainly to get to the United States and, and what was then British mandated Palestine. But the United States didn't open up our um, um, quotas for immigration really until 1948. So that's three years after the end of the war as people have been living in these conditions. And this is a picture um, from uh, somebody who was wounded uh, from the Exodus 1947 ship. And it's just meant to demonstrate um, the difficulty that, that survivors had in, in reaching Palestine as well. Jews had not been allowed to immigrate to Palestine since 1939. And that remained after the war. Um, and so the Exodus 1947 is just one of many, but the most famous example of a, a ship that was turned away from Palestine. It had 4,500 survivors on it. And this was in um, summer 1947. It arrived on the shores of Palestine. Um, the British said, no, you can't come in. They, um, there was violence. A few, uh, two people were killed and dozens of others were injured, including this woman. And then they were sent back to Germany, back to these camps to try to find a place to go. So, it, so, and again, right, Israel doesn't become Israel until after a series of wars and um, until 1948. Um, so this is three full years where people had very little um, choice of going anywhere. And then finally, I'm just going to say a last word about the lasting impacts of the Holocaust, just so we know that, you know, here I've explained how it didn't end in 1945, but you could make a pretty strong argument that um, you know, there's a way, there are ways in which it, it will never end and it can never be um, uh, there's no solution for the, the uh, destruction that took place um, there. So let me show you this last slide. Um, and so I, I did some statistical, it's not what I do as a historian, I did some statistical research. And I found that in 1939, there were over, there were 16 million 728 Jews in the world. And after the Holocaust, there were 11 million. So that means that um, a significant percentage of Jews were killed just outright in the war. Um, and as of 2021, there were 15,166,200 Jews in the world. So even um, after all this time, the, the Jewish community has not <laughs> gone back to the same levels that had been before the war. During the Holocaust, the whole of, of, you, of um, worldwide Jewry went down by 34%. So, you know, that's not, you know, that's, there were Jews in America and in the Middle East and in South America, and, you know, there were a lot of Jews in Russia that, you know, the Nazis didn't make it that far, but still such a third of all Jews in the world were killed during the Holocaust and 63% of Jews in Europe were killed during the Holocaust, which is just impossible to, um, get around in terms of like a gaping hole in the communities of Jews. And in 1939, uh, another interesting statistic, 0.83% of the world's population was Jewish. And today, or as of 2020, 0.19% of the world's population. So um, it, there's just really no comparison. And then I just wanted to show you, because I thought it was super fascinating, um, this last map. Um, just to give you a visual of what I just told you. All right. 
So this is, these are statistics from 2010. So they are a bit outdated, but they are closer to 2010 than 1933. Um, so this is an interactive map with the world's religions. The purple, the dark purple is Christianity. Um, and the, the dark green is Islam. The pink here, um, you know, is non-religious and the red is Buddhism. So you can kind of see right here, we have Hinduism uh, is orange. So you can see them. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can't see the map. You can't see the map. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Maybe let me see. New share. I can do this. Let's see. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. Now we can. See yes. It. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So dark purple Christian, dark green Islam. Um, and so, and then when you click on it, it's just really cool. So I recommend anybody go check it out later. Um, uh, PBS, you know, world religions map. But like in the United States, for example, you can see 78.3% of the population is Christian, 1.8% is Jewish. Um, and then, you know, in Europe, for example, Poland, I told you before the war was 10% Jewish. Now it's, it's less than 0.1% Jewish. So, you know, just to see how the numbers really um, have shifted. Um, and then of course we have Israel, you have Judaism is the blue and there's one little country. And so here we have, um, sorry, Israel, in which 75.6% 75 75 of people living there are Jewish. And so, um, you know, today the centers of world Jewry are the United States and Israel with, um, you know, about 6 million in, in Israel, about 5 million in the United States, and then others kind of, you know, scattered throughout the world. Um, but Europe is no longer and never will be again the center of world Jewry. Right, that is it for me, and I will turn it over to Dr. Bacic. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Simon, and thank you so much, Ben, for organizing this event uh, and for inviting me, and thank you all in the audience. Um, uh, for coming to listen and engage with us. So the aim of my remarks today is to highlight certain aspects of the Poremos, which is the Romani Holocaust, uh, and to link them to the treatment of Roma today. Now, I will only be talking about some aspects of both, uh, but you should be prepared. This is a difficult topic. So today, Roma are Europe's largest ethnic minority with an estimated population between um, 10 and 12 million. They are not a homogenous ethnic group. So instead, Roma communities are tremendously diverse um, and they differ considerably in you know, terms of way of life, language, their name, as well as degree of marginalization and inclusion. So today I'll be using the word Roma to refer to the umbrella community that also includes Sinti, Manush, Kala, and so on. So a bit of background first. Um, linguistic and more recently uh, gene sequencing studies uh, trace the Romani diaspora to Northwestern India. Um, Roma are said to have migrated about 1500 years ago uh, to the Near and Middle East and then spread to the European space via the Balkans um, starting about 900 years ago. Now, the practice of excluding Roma communities can be traced back centuries. Um, they were typically denied access to cities in Central and Western Europe. They were violently repressed, hunted, exiled, or forcibly assimilated. And in parts of Romania, Roma were enslaved until the mid 1800s. Now, currently, Roma are st still stereotyped as cheaters, thieves, and takers. And I can say more about that later. Um, but they're also often thought of as itinerant. Uh, most Roma populations are in fact settled today uh, and some have been for centuries. But in the first decades of the 1900s in Germany, many Roma were still itinerant. And there, Romani caravans were seen as a nuisance, especially in the inner cities. So in the winter months, Roma were able to stay in municipal camps that were built mostly in the early 1930s. And this was mainly to you know, rid the cities of uh, unwanted elements, as they called them. 
Uh, and foreshadowing what was to come later, the one in Frankfurt was actually called the concentration camp at the time. And so some Roma would bring their caravans to those camps and many who stayed there were poor because those who were better off, uh, they had their houses, right? Or better lodgings and didn't have to stay in the camps. Now these camps were guarded by law enforcement. Um, they had sign in, sign out procedures, um, no begging rules, um, some low welfare payments and conditions were generally harsh. And eventually the character of these camps changed and people were unable to leave and compulsory labor started. So here I need to pause uh, and clarify a point. So initially Roma were not targeted on the basis of their ethnicity per se. Instead, they were branded as a social. I'll be using this word a lot. Um, so the so-called asocials um, were people who demonstrated by their conduct, even if not criminal, that they were unwilling to adapt to the life of the community. And so Roma were swept up in this group, especially if they were itinerant, um, because this was not what the community did. Um, but often also if they were not. So their records, files on individuals who essentially state that this person has not been involved in any such activity, but then they still ended up in the camp. So they were not explicitly targeted because of their ethnic identity, but on the grounds of their way of life. And this is how the argument went. It's quite clear, however, that Roma as a group were strongly represented um, in this group. Uh, of asocials. Um, asocials had their uniforms marked with black triangles um, and they worked in stone quarries and were brutally treated. So this is all before the war started, right? So by 1939, there were over 10,000 asocials in those camps. Um, and we don't have very good counts on how many were Roma, but given that the Romani itinerant lifestyle qualified them as asocial and there were generally no other groups that would qualify as the same in these numbers. We can suspect, suspect that the numbers of Roma in those camps were high. Now, that is not to say that there was no group specific animus against the Roma, right? Just the opposite. And just to clarify, right? Animus is hatred directed at someone because that person is a member of a particular group. No other reason, no personal grievance, just purely hatred on the basis of some sort of identity. Now, by the mid 1930s, the Roma had been abused for centuries, not decades, right? And this type of animus is insidious. It develops between people, is seen in everyday interactions, it's spread and strengthened by the media. And so by 1936, um, people felt freer to speak openly against the Roma and actually vehemently demanded that something be done. And these demands for annihilation were actually bottom up, coming from ordinary citizens, public officials, academics, publicists, and many of those individuals were actually not members of the Nazi party. And so at the time, Hitler was less concerned with Roma because they were seen as a nuisance and a plague and they were not that numerous. And still Himmler's justification for measures going forward at that point started crossing the line between what they called a social and racially unclean. And so initially these measures included counting and registering all Roma, uh, noting that on personal documents and on registration papers for itinerant business, driver's licenses and camping permits. And later they took photographs, measurements, blood samples, and they constructed genealogies. So by 1939, um, they had complete information on 20,000 Roma. And so as these registration efforts were underway, other policies that resulted in extreme exclusion, control, and eventually death were already in place, right? So this is early in the timeline. So first schools. So initially Roma children would be put into separate classes and then into separate special schools. And then Romani students could and would be expelled altogether on the grounds of constituting a moral or other danger to children of German blood, right? And this was a direct quote. Um, 
Nazis forced them into compulsory labor and work education camps. And then if inmates resumed irregular work habits, they were sent to concentration camps. The second dimension here is marriage and reproductive rights. So marriages between Roma and Germans were banned and marriages between Roma were regulated. And often if Roma agreed to be sterilized, they were able to marry. Now at the time, sterilization of the genetically unfit uh, was practiced elsewhere, in the United States, in Sweden, and so on. Sweden actually sterilized a social as well after World War II. But the speed with which Nazi Germany sterilized individuals was much higher. And so by the time the war started, 300,000 persons were sterilized. And so in 1936, social failure became a viable criterion for sterilization. And this broad criterion encompassed things like not going to school or not enrolling in special school. But remember, right, school was eventually not allowed for Roma. Or having children out of wedlock, but also remember that marriage was regulated, right? Things like lack of occupation, reliance on welfare, itinerant lifestyle were all viable criteria. And as a result, Roma were sterilized at high rates and throughout. So that was actually the main method of planned extermination for the Roma, right? Well, the killings in the camps were, were methodically um, carried out. Um, they were as carefully planned out as the attempts uh, to exterminate through mass sterilization. And so there was a fair amount of disagreement um, as to the severity of, of, of measures intended to exterminate Roma, but Right, no mistake here, there was finality in all directions. It was just a question of how. So the disagreements were largely between immediate death, working camps until death, or sterilization. So when it came to, to camps um, um, during the war, uh, Roma were generally held separately from other groups and not everyone was deported because many were able to avoid it by volunteering to be sterilized. Um, Nevertheless, right, Nazis killed thousands um, in the gas vans of Chalma. And in Serbia, Nazis killed Roma in massive revenge shootings. Uh, I suspect that it looks similar to one of the photographs that Dr. Simon showed. Um, and that ratio um, was 100 Roma per every Nazi soldier who was killed. Um, there was a mass deportation of Roma to Auschwitz in 1943. Um, very few survived. And Roma for, from camps in Leti and Hodonim, so that's um, Czech Republic, uh, were also eventually taken there. And Roma were also victims of medical experiments in Dachau and Buchenwald and Ravensbrück. So there's no exact count of how many Roma died at the hands of Nazis. Um, we have estimates. So some estimates say 200,000. Some estimates say half a million. But since Roma were massively sterilized, scholars also talk about a delayed genocide, um, at least in instances that didn't focus on immediate murder. And so aside from discrimination and the physical realities of the horrific treatment, um, the treatment of Roma also resulted in immense cultural trauma. Uh, and there's certain aspects of Romani culture, as any culture, um, that were violated by Nazi treatment that have particular significance. For example, elders who are protectors of cultural heritage were killed. Another example, children are tremendously valued in Romani culture and communities and mass sterilizations took that away and introduced massive trauma. So most Roma who applied for restitution during the early post-war years were turned down on the grounds that they weren't targeted for their ethnicity, but instead for their way of life. The compensation law of 1953 did not include Roma as victims who were entitled to restitution. Then the revised decision in 1963 did, but Roma had trouble applying for it, partly because of exploitation by lawyers, little support from doctors and other administrative barriers, such as Roma marriages not being recognized. And victims of sterilization were not eligible because sterilization was not seen as causing any diminishing of the ability to earn a living. 
Now, since the 1970s, Roma activists and researchers have fought to have the genocide acknowledged as part of a wider movement for Roma rights. And crimes against the Roma during World War II were officially recognized by the German authorities in 1982. And 30 years later, in 2012, a memorial to the Roma genocide in Berlin was unveiled. And so present day, we observe August 2nd as the European Roma Genocide Memorial Day. Um, when we think about the legacies of the Roma genocide, um, the first that comes to mind, obviously, is the inability of tens of thousands to bear children and the psychological and cultural trauma that comes with that. But there is another set of issues relevant here. Um, and there are things that Nazis did to the Roma during Purim laws that members of other majorities continue to do afterwards. So I'm gonna list a couple. So first is sterilization. In Czech Republic and Slovakia, uh, Sterilizations of Romani women continued past the 1990s. In Slovakia, during the 1980s, about 1,000 Romani women are said to have been sterilized per year. So in 2004 and 2005, 87 victims of coercive sterilization in Czech Republic, all but one of them women, and the over, overwhelming majority were Romani, submitted complaints to the Czech Public Defender of Rights. And so in 2009, the Czech prime minister expressed his regret. Now, Sweden co coercively sterilized Roma quite extensively too until 1976. At that point, the procedures there stopped, but registrations of Roma have not, right? Recall now the Nazi registration efforts. So in 2013, there were still registers of Roma in Sweden purportedly for criminal purposes. But then it was revealed that those lists actually contained over a thousand names of Romani children, some as young as two. So another link to the past that we still very much observe today is segregation in education. So in some schools, Roma students sit, sit in the back row in some schools, they're in segregated classroom, and in some districts, they actually go to different schools altogether. Often those are um, special schools, um, which is what they're still called. Um, recall that they were also called that in Nazi Germany, um, which are schools for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Now, in the early 2000s, in some areas across Europe, up to 80% of Roma students were sent to segregated schools. Now, there's reasons. Segregation is driven by financial incentives for schools. Anti-Roma sentiment among parents of non-Roma children results in pressures towards schools to segregate, right? And in this country, we are familiar with white flight. And in some localities, Roma parents are offer, offered financial incentives to send their children to segregated schools, and poverty makes these incentives um, incredibly val valuable. So strategic uh, litigation has secured a number of favorable decisions from the European Court of Human Rights, but enforcement remains a challenge. So by and large, a lot of districts are still segregated today. Next, we know that anti-Roma sentiment persists. France, Italy, and Denmark engage in expulsions and deportations of Roma, and ghettoization continues. Many Roma communities across Europe live in isolated, segregated neighborhoods. And in some instances, non-Roma mayors in countries like Slovenia, Czech Republic, Romania, and, and others as well, actually build walls to separate the Roma neighborhoods from the rest of town if the distance is seen you know, too small. So to be sure, many Roma today don't suffer such exclusion at all. As I mentioned in the beginning, Romani communities are tremendously diverse, as are the members of those communities. But today, I chose to highlight these things because they're linked to what the Roma suffered under the Nazis seems so direct. So what can we do, right? What can you do? I will close with this first step which is raise awareness, educate yourself, and learn from Roma scholars and from Roma grassroots activists. 
especially Roma youth activists and their efforts regarding education and remembrance of the genocide. So I'm going to put in a link of, of a good side that Roma youth activists have developed um, so that you can explore more. So thank you so much for, again, inviting me and, and listening today. Um, thank you. I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll move things on. Thank you so much. Um, I learned a great deal. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, uh, so um, uh, thank you all. I want to sort of repeat the thanks that Dr. Simon and Dr. Brotich gave for everyone to, to be here this evening. I'm sorry that it is not in person, but I agree that it's, it's wonderful to be able to reach so many people. I'm so thrilled to see um, so many participants here. Um, I am going to share my screen. Uh, oh, but the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So um, uh, perhaps somebody could fix that for me. Um, uh, and um, I'll just start by giving you a little bit of background while hopefully um, that will happen. There we go. Um, uh, hold on one second, sorry. Um, sorry, everyone. Let me just make sure I get this down correctly. Um, I'll let you all know that my, my um, research initially, hmm, I'm having trouble with my Screen share. Let's see if we can do this and then do this. There we go. Did, did that work? Can people tell me if that worked, if you can see that? It worked. Okay, great. Um, so um, just as a way of sort of starting this off, so my first project, and I think the thing that maybe made me seem like a logical person to speak after Dr. Simon and Dr. Brachish was really important and really valuable presentations on the Holocaust um, and Jews and on Roma. Um, uh, I'm an American Jewish historian, um, and my first book was on the impact of the Holocaust on American Jews and on American Jewish culture. Um, and uh, so um, I'm gonna start off with that because that actually um, is usually when, when people think about this kind of question of the impact of the Holocaust, when they think of the Holocaust and American Jews, um, or the impact of the Holocaust in the United States, it's frequently its impact on American Jews. Um, there was a traditional view that American Jews were completely silent uh, about the Holocaust, that they didn't say anything. This was a persistent belief for years. Um, and my work and other works um, sort of made the argument that that wasn't the case. Um, and so you can see here, um, uh, a, um, a prayer that became uh, uh, popularized by the American Jewish Congress in 1952 um, uh, that was uh, um, uh, for um, uh, uh, Jews to remember the six million Jews and for the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, there was in fact a, a great deal of remembrance um, that my work has talked about and that other people's work has talked about. Um, and there has been um, much more attention, um, as Dr. Simon talked about, to sort of uh, legacies of survivors um, and the impact of survivors in the American Jewish community, although not as much as there should be. But that's kind of traditionally at least one way that people have thought about the impact of the Holocaust and the legacies of the Holocaust in the United States. Um, and my own work was kind of on the legacies of the Holocaust on kind of American Jews kind of political understandings in the 1960s, the ways that fears of persecution, that sort of remembrances of what had happened to Jews um, uh, in Nazi Germany really affected American Jews who saw themselves as potentially um, uh, victims. Um, and that's one way that historians have thought about the impact of the Holocaust um, in the United States. Another way that you all are probably familiar with and probably is the most familiar way of thinking about the impact of the Holocaust in the United States is the impact on American culture, which has been tremendous. And of course, I give two images here of Anne Frank on the left um, and of Art Spiegelman's Mouse on the right, which has recently made it um, back into the news. Um, uh, these, you know, really powerful works, The Diary of Anne Frank and then Mouse, have uh, um, been sort of central to Americans thinking about the Holocaust. Um, it's thinking about what happened to Jews in particular in the Holocaust. Um, 
and uh, have, have been on curricula, school curricula for years to teach Americans about the Holocaust. Um, and so this, there's been much written about this, um, about sort of the impact of the Holocaust, um, particularly in thinking about Jews, about Jewish victims. Um, uh, that has been kind of a central part of American culture. Um, and again, there's been a great deal written about this and, and thought about it. Um, and so because of kind of what I was asked to speak about tonight, which was kind of both the impact of the Holocaust and also American anti-Semitism, which is actually my, the new work that I'm working on is American anti-Semitism. Um, my second book was on name changing, Jews changing their names because of discrimination um, and anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews. And so actually I thought that I would put these together a little bit um, and think a little bit about the impact of the Holocaust on American anti-Semitism, which is actually not the ways that most people kind of conceptualize or think about it. Um, you know, the Holocaust tends to be seen as a very European phenomenon. And as Dr. Simon sort of suggested, you know, America is seen as this kind of haven generally probably wrongly um, uh, or certainly inaccurately with a lot of um, mistakes and kind of imagination that wasn't the case. Um, United States maintained quotas and did not say of many of the Jews who could have been saved. Um, but that, you know, in general, the anti-Semitism of, of Europe and of G Nazi Germany in particular is kind of set separate from the United States, um, which frequently um, uh, its anti-Semitism has um, been ignored or not treated as much by American historians or American Jewish historians. Um, so just American anti-Semitism itself is understudied in American Jewish history. Um, and then really kind of the interpenetration of the ways that Nazi Germany um, and the ways that the Holocaust shaped American anti-Semitism has, has not really been talked about. When I told some friends and some family members that I was going to be talking about this, they wanted me to sort of bring up the ways that American eugenics, that American Jim Crow shaped Nazi German ideas, shaped Hitler's ideas about race um, and about the possibilities of, of, of racism and racial segregation and, and a racial state. And that is to be sure true. Um, I, I want to look tonight at some of the ways, and these may seem obvious to you, but actually they have they have they're obvious, I think, only because of the contemporary world we're living in. And I'm gonna talk about that towards the end. Um, but in general, you know, his, people don't think all the time about the ways that the Holocaust at Nazi Germany actually shaped a lot of the ways that American anti-Semitism has kind of been laid out both before and after the war. So I'm going to sort of talk about some ways here that I think you can see the impact of Nazi Germany, the impact of um, the Holocaust on American anti-Semitism. Um, so I'm going to give you a few examples. First, before World War II, Dr. Simon mentioned that the Holocaust Museum now sort of you know, looks at 1933 and through 1945 as the years of the Holocaust, which makes this even more significant. With the rise of Nazi Germany, um, the impact of that rhetoric, the impact of that those politics really did shape American anti-Semitism on these shores. Um, so one way that we can talk about this is the proliferation of hate groups in the United States. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the image in a second that I have up here. Um, but uh, the years between 1933 and 1941 saw over a hundred anti-Semitic hate groups constructed in the United States. Um, when before 33, there had been maybe five total in the United States. So there is a normalization um, and an encouragement of um, this kind of anti-Semitic hatred that is absolutely being pushed and mobilized and encouraged by what's going on in Europe. Sometimes this is very direct. Um, there was a German-American Bund, that is the image that you see in front of you, um, uh, which was um, in part constructed um, and, and given aid by Nazi Germany, although there was also, you know, sort of an American born or an American Fritz Kuhn who, who really kind of, uh, or, you know, pushed and organized the movement himself. But, you know, there, there is this German American Bund, um, but there are also a whole host of other groups that actually were more American in character, like the night places that things that you might not have heard of, the Knights of White Camellia, um, the Christian Front, which was the organization that was um, uh, sort of uh, inspired by and encouraged by um, Father Charles Coughlin, um, a radio priest that you might have heard of. Um, so there are these tremendous numbers of groups. Um, uh, that are proliferating and in 
speaking anti-Semitic rhetoric, posting anti-Semitic rhetoric um, on placards, on leaflets, um, you know, attacking Jews on street corners verbally, but also physically. This actually leads to violence in cities like Boston, New York. Um, there is actually violence that's being committed on Jews. There's There are Christian front gangs that will track down stock and track down um, Jewish teenagers um, and attack them. And the police would actually arrest those Jewish teenagers um, and let the members of the gangs go. Um, so what we can see is a proliferation of hate groups at this time and really kind of a normalization of some of the rhetoric and some of the violence that they are encouraging. Um, the image that I'm giving you here, um, you know, you can see the prominence of the swastika right next to um, the image of George Washington um, and American flags on the dais there. Um, uh, this uh, this was a rally um, uh, held in Madison Square Garden um, uh, in uh, 1939. Um, sorry, I don't I have the date on my notes. Um, uh, and 22,000 members of the German American Bund attended, listened to anti Semitic attacks, um, uh, carried out Hitler's salutes, um, and in general um, proposed um, sort of attacks on Jews um, that were right out of kind of Nazi language. Um, uh, a Jew uh, who actually had gotten into the stadium actually rushed the, the, the stage at one point and was brutally attacked um, by Nazis on stage um, and police let it go for quite some time. Um, so you can see, I think, hopefully the ways that the sort of the images of these swastikas um, which people are wearing, being connected to the emergence of these hate groups and a real kind of normalization of, or a, a popularization of this kind of rhetoric. Um, and then I would say, I mean, this is, these are clearly more extreme groups, right? Um, but they are taking place alongside a backdrop of um, growing anti-Semitic rhetoric among the general population. Um, uh, there are letters to Congress written, Congress people at this time written that express from, from ordinary, you know, rubber plant workers and doctors and Episcopalian ministers um, that basically identified the Jew as the center of all troubles. About half of Americans polled at this time believed that Jews brought all the troubles that were happening to them in Europe upon themselves. Um, so there's a great deal of this rhetoric that is being normalized at this time. So even though these groups might seem extreme, they are in an environment where this kind of rhetoric um, is, is being normalized. Um, and much of what I wrote about in my book is actually discrimination, which began before the Nazi regime in the United States, for sure. Um, there are severe um, uh, limitations on Jews entering um, colleges throughout the United States especially on the Northeast, um, and also being um, kept out of a whole host of jobs. Um, it's a great deal of employment and education discrimination, um, which is seen as completely respectable, legitimate, and, and is, is also sort of a piece of this kind of American anti-Semitism that is normalized and legitimized by the growth of these movements and by Nazi rhetoric. Um, so I'll say that in sort of traditional views, sort of in, in the ways that historians have traditionally seen what the impact of the Holocaust was in American anti-Semitism, historians have sort of talked about, you know, sort of the, the, the this rally um, and, and sort of the growth of these hate groups. But the traditional view is that um, World War II and the Holocaust shut all of this down, um, that um, the limitations on Jews um, were erased, um, that anti-Semitism became um, disreputable um, after World War II, after people saw what had happened in the Holocaust, um, they were embarrassed and ashamed um, that hate groups were shut down by the government, which was in part true um, right during World War II, um, and that they basically became a crackpot fringe group, um, these kinds of hate groups, um, and that those quotas that sort of the respectability of anti-Semitism declined after World War II. Um, and so I will say that a, a lot of my research has actually found that um, it, that, that was not the case in two ways. 
or my research found it in one way, but I'm gonna present you with a few things that suggest that that was not the case in, in another way. So my research on name changing, which Jews mostly did in order to be able to get jobs and to get into schools when they couldn't do so. Um, uh, Jews are doing that from in the 1940s, they do it in the 1950s, they do it even all the way through the 1960s. So it is not simply sort of that Americans kind of looked at the Holocaust and said, this is embarrassing and we're going to drop these practices. Um, I show a movie, the, the poster of a movie, Gentleman's Agreement here, which was a very prominent uh, movie that sort of attacked the problem of anti-Semitism in 1947. So two years after the Holocaust, uh, this movie expressed a litany of kind of respectable anti-Semitism, not even kind of, you know, the fringe hatred, but, you know, a litany of anti-Semitism. And it took a, at least a decade to, for Jewish groups to actually fight for these quotas and this kind of discrimination to end. So um, kind of a view that had been a standard one that after World War II, this became just reputable and that, you know, Americans just stop being anti-Semitic because they were embarrassed um, is, is, is really problematic um, and needs to really be reconsidered, um, I think, from, from the research that I did. But I also want to sort of bring up the fact that there's been other recent research, and, and I think our contemporary moment sort of wants us to relook a bit at the notion that, you know, sort of hate groups and sort of fringe kind of very extreme anti-Semitism that use swastikas and things like that and violence um, also became kind of a crackpot fringe, something that people didn't need to worry about. Um, so I'm going to sort of offer a few places where we can see even in the 1940s, 1950s and 1960s, a real continuation and a prominence of extreme violent anti-Semitic hate groups. Um, so one way in which we can kind of see um, kind of what we would see as extreme anti-Semitism is the beginnings of Holocaust denial, even in the 1940s and the 1950s. So here I'm using the work of my great colleague and friend, John Jackson, um, who um, has published on the fact that um, conservative presses in the United States that are still around, like Regnery, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Regnery or Regnery, um, even in the 1940s and 1950s, we're publishing the works of European fascists that were blaming the World War II on the Allies and on Roosevelt um, and arguing um, that whatever atrocities the Nazis had, um, had committed were equal to or not as bad as what the Allies had done. Um, which is basically kind of a backbone of Holocaust denialism, right? To be able to argue that the Holocaust didn't exist, one of the sort of centerpieces of that argument is to sort of say, well, yeah, some things happened, but it's nowhere near as bad as what happened on the side of the Allies, or it's equal to what happened on the side of the Allies. Um, and these kinds of arguments are being published by Renuri in the 1940s after the war. Um, this book that I've got for you is one of the most prominent being published by an American in 1952. Um, and it's being championed, if not by mainstream conservatives, then by mainstream libertarians um, all the way through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so this is kind of the origins of Holocaust denialism that we can see even early on people sort of saying this wasn't that bad. This wasn't that bad. What the Allies did was just as bad. Um, and it's finding voice um, in mainstream spaces. So that's one place that I think you can kind of see newer literature saying that this actually has an impact, right? That fascists from Europe and people in the United States who want to kind of reject some of the the unique horribleness of what happened during the Holocaust, um, that it begins even during these early years right after the war. Um, you can see um, the um, ex continuing existence and the emergence of many more hate groups in the United States, um, uh, particularly during the civil rights era as the civil rights movement um, became more prominent um, in the 1950s. You see the growth of hate groups um, that are both uh, racist that are both anti-civil rights and anti-black, but also anti-Jewish and see Jews at the center of the civil rights movement. So there are a spate of synagogue bombings. Um, this is an image from Atlanta, which was probably the most famous. Um, the, the large reform temple in Atlanta was bombed um, in 1958. Um, uh, and I've shown you on the side there, although it's not a good enough picture. I'm sorry, I didn't look at it 
closely enough, the national states' right, rights party um, members um, were, were responsible for this. Um, uh, the five people who who um, were convicted for responsibility, or excuse me, were tried for responsibility in this, were members of the National States Rights Party. Um, it, during the civil rights movement in the South, um, about over 40 anti-Semitic groups um, were organized at this time. So this is not just this one group, there is actually a network of um, hate groups that emerge at this time that see Jews at the center of um, the civil rights movement. Um, and as you can see here, respond with violence. Um, I wanted to sort of note um, uh, the sort of the continuing power of the swastika during these years. This is an image of George Lincoln Walkwell, who um, sort of founded the American Nazi Party um, in the post-war years. He was kind of a showman, and uh, you know, he he loved to attract publicity to himself, protesting the um, the March on Washington, um, parodying the Freedom Rides of the, of the early 1960s, kind of inserting himself and frankly using swastikas as a means of gaining attention. Um, and we can see that continually happening through this time period. There are swastikas um, drawn on uh, Jewish cemeteries and things like that, that are drawing attention to white supremacy throughout this period. Um, and even though, again, he's seen as this kind of extreme figure, he does get, get attention. And his the, the power of that image and his ideas don't completely disappear. Um, uh, um, his, um, his, one of his uh, acolytes, or one of his, I would guess you would say, one of his right-hand men was a man named William Luther Pierce, who wrote a, um, a uh, dystopian novel called The Turner Diaries, um, which was published in 1978, which was basically, he's, so he was this neo-Nazi, this man, William Luther Pierce, worked with George Lincoln Rockwell um, and published this book, which has been seen as uh, basically a handbook for racist, anti-Semitic, um, neo-Nazi violence in the United States. Um, it imagines kind of a government that confiscates everyone's guns and discriminates and attacks white people. And so it imagines that the only resistance can be violence against the state. Um, Timothy McVeigh, even though he was portrayed as a lone wolf, um, was actually a part of white power movements, um, was actually a part of a white power movement. And the Turner Diaries clearly kind of described a, a, a violent event like the Oklahoma City bombing, which killed 168 people um, in 1995. Um, and clippings of the Turner Diaries were found in his car. Um, so clearly the impetus for violence um, uh, among Nazis within the United States um, is, is, is still very much present um, in white power movements, which have actually been growing in recent years. Um, and so I um, wanted to leave uh, you by sort of thinking about two, well, one very prominent instance of American anti-Semitism today and sort of seeing it as kind of kind of being traced in a lineage from these earlier moments, which is clearly the Charlottesville image on the left in which um, uh, in 2017, people marched with uh, swastikas, with SS lightning bolts, with a whole host of Nazi iconography and shouted Jews will not replace us um, uh, and spouted other elements of kind of neo-Nazi rhetoric. Um, uh, and I in part bring it up um, because or show it alongside the image on the right, which you might not be familiar with, I don't know. Um, the, so the image on the right was actually an anti-Semitic, um, from an anti-Semitic incident that took place this weekend, this past weekend, January 31st. There were actually a number this weekend. Um, these were small rallies held in Florida um, of uh, people carrying National Socialist signs, um, signs with swastikas. Um, yelling just kind of on street corners. This is in Orlando, um, yelling at street corners, um, actually engaging in an assault of one um, uh, driver who stopped to, to, to argue with them. 
Um, and the reason I bring both of these up is simply together, um, in, in addition to the fact that they're just both examples of American anti-Semitism today, is that I think what really needs to be thought of that is different from the earlier instances that I portrayed for you, even though there are a lot of through lines, um, is that um, in 2017, Donald Trump refused to um, uh, condemn what happened in Charlottesville, right? And he said there were, you know, fine people on both sides and and really refused to condemn it. And uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is seen as the person who is most likely to um, uh, maybe compete with uh, Trump for the presidency for the Republican nomination in 2024, has also thus far refused to condemn uh, these these rallies that took place in his state. Um, so I think what you can see that you didn't see in earlier moments that you can see now is perhaps some greater respectability um, and some greater sort of political um, appreciation um, or maybe fear of these movements. And I'm sorry to end on such a negative note, but that's where I see the world today. So thank you. And I look forward to any questions and just talking with people in general. Thank you so much for three and enlightening, um, very <laughs> sad uh, topics, but enlightening topics that unfortunately are still uh, timely in many ways today. I know um, Amy Simon had a had an op-ed in the Lansing State Journal last week, which also pointed to um, surveys that we had all discussed showing that 63% of millennials and Gen Z um, didn't know, uh, don't know that 6 million Jews um, were killed in the Holocaust and 48% couldn't name a single concentration camp. And I suspect that uh, far fewer than that know about the Roma experience in the Holocaust. Um, so thank you um, to all three of you for, for uh, giving us that necessary historical context and for Kirsten also be giving us that history in the United States and bringing it to contemporary times. And of course, we all know that anti-Semitism has been rising rapidly that um, at least a third of um, students at uh, American campuses experienced anti-Semitism over the past year. Uh, and that um, it's we've had over 80 incidents on our campus in the last few years. So this is certainly something that we're paying increasing attention to, unfortunately. So I saw three questions, so let me ask those. Um, I think um, well, I think they're, they're essentially two questions and I think they're for you, um, Professor from English. So uh, one is by Lisa Ratza Soshens. Um, so were, and she asked, were Jewish people um, targeted because they marched for civil rights? Um, so was that kind of one, you know, one reason you had those synagogue bombings that you were explaining? And the second question um, is by Antonia Gordon and uh, she says, it appears that the most of the anti-Semitic practices in the US were normative socially, but not necessarily um, by law like Jim Crow. So were there actual policies that discriminated against the Jewish community? Uh, okay, well, thank you for, for both of those questions. I didn't write them down though. So I hope I'm, that I'm gonna remember them. So the first question was about um, whether Jews were targeted because they marched for civil rights. Um, and I would say kind of yes and no. So the Atlanta bombing, for example, I mean, it wasn't necessarily about Jews marching. There was a perception um, that Jews supported civil rights, um, which, um, in the Atlanta bombing, that that synagogue, the rabbi was actually an activist for civil rights. He didn't march necessarily, but he supported it. Right, he worked for sort of you know um, organizations that were looking for peaceful integration in town. And so, yes, in that sense, it was seen as kind of a warning to him. But in a larger way, um, I think it probably fits more under kind of a little bit of what Dr. Simon suggested that th there was kind of conspiracy theories um, about Jews supporting race mixing right, that they were supporting civil rights because they were looking for the downfall of Christian civilization and American American civilization. And so I, they weren't necessarily always noting that, yeah, there were a lot of Jews marching for civil rights. And in fact, in the South, among Southern Jews, they mostly were not. I mean, it was true that there were a lot of Northern Jews who did go down, but there actually weren't a lot of Southern Jews. They were mostly felt, felt fairly vulnerable as a very small minority, and there were not very many of them who, who were very active. It was more Northern Jews. But yeah, yeah, for many of these groups, they were not, I mean, they did notice, right, that there were, the, you know, two of the men killed um, during Freedom Summer who were Jewish, 
they were identified as Jews and that was a part of their killing. But more, I think of the targeting was, was um, being done uh, because of these kind of fiction, these, these imaginations of the Jew and, and how the Jew was, was behind the civil rights movement. Um, so that's a really, that's a great question. Thank you. And then the second question I think was about sort of whether anti-Semitic discrimination um, was, was legal like Jim Crow. Um, and that is, that is, I, I'm smiling, I'm laughing because that is actually my project for the next 18 months um, is to really be looking at the ways in which anti-Semitism was, um, or, or I'll say sort of systemic racism against Jews was, was a part or was not a part, the, the ways in which it was a part of American government. So no, there was no Jim Crow um, against Jews. That is certainly true. However, it is also true that the discrimination that was practiced against Jews um, in, in employment, in housing, actually in housing, it was actually, that was the product of redlining that people talk about that was acted against African-Americans was also acted against Jews. So that, that was actually a place where you could absolutely see federal government policies being enacted against Jews. Um, people also point to immigration policy. So immigration quotas that, that did not allow Jews in were things that were enacted by the United States government with very clear, you know, the congressional record is filled with, um, you know, sort of anti-Semitic um, sentiment as to why um, Jewish immigrants, um, as along with others, should not be um, allowed. Um, and then finally, um, you know, things like employment discrimination or uh, discrimination in colleges, for example, are things that not only are there now laws against that, but there actually were laws against that after reconstruction in the 19th century that simply were not enforced. Um, and that is why they were allowed to take place. So there are certain acts of co uh, commission um, and then acts of omission, right? The United States government simply not enforcing and saying, sure, it's okay for private institutions to discriminate when in fact there were civil rights acts passed after reconstruction that technically made that illegal. Um, so it's a complicated answer. It's not a yes or no. And so it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm going to be exploring and I will come back in 18 months and answer that question better, I hope. But thank you for it. Thank you. Our next question um, from Annette Wainchank is, could you speak to um, uh, anti-Semitism that's coming from the left currently? And I know that um, Dr. Amy Simon teaches a class on anti-Semitism and Professor from English um, teaches a class on American Jewish history. And we've been on workshops that that address this. So um, that's open to both of you if you'd like to speak some to um, anti-Semitism that's also coming from the left. I'll let you take that, Amy, since I just did a lot of talking. I mean, all I want to say is, I mean, obviously, because of the nature of this panel on Holocaust, you know, where we both focused on the kind of neo-Nazi white supremacist part of, of anti-Semitism. Um, but I mean, this is a big part of the conversation that all American Jews, and certainly uh, Jews in Jewish studies departments, Jews on college campus, uh, you know, Jewish faculty and people involved in Jewish studies on um, college campuses are, are definitely thinking a lot about um, left-wing left -wing anti-Semitism, um, which you know, involves um, anti-Israel sentiment. Um, and the reason why is that there are huge numbers of our students who are experiencing you know, hatred, um, anti-Semitism, sometimes even you know, depending on the campus and the people involved, sometimes even you know, outright hostility um, you know, as a result of, you know, um, ideas about Jews and Israel, right? The idea that all American Jews support Israel, support everything about Israel, um, support Israeli policies, support, you know, um, all kinds of things that they may or may not. Um, and so this kind of blanket uh, association of Jews and American Jews with Israel um, and the frustrations uh, about Palestinian rights there um, are just continuing and, and cause a lot of trouble um, for a lot of students. And there are certain universities where this is, you know, outright hostility, where Jews literally, you know, are facing, um, uh, you know, desecration of their property or, you know, vandalism, um, sometimes, uh, you know, not not so much violence, but a lot of, you know, um, 
just anti-Semitic remarks on a regular basis, harassment, I guess I would say. Um, so, so yeah, this is a big thing. It's, it's, it's you know, an important issue that we're always trying to address. Um, Professor Aronoff, as our Israel chair, um, has kind of taken the, the role in all, we do a lot of anti-Semitism trainings and we talk about both left and right and we talk about historical anti-Semitism and she talks a lot about left wing as a um, Israel scholars expert, uh, Israel scholar who again, kind of like myself as well. Kirsten's the only one here who uh, actually uh, somebody that started talking about anti-Semitism kind of before five years ago, <laughs> or maybe you didn't. I mean, I don't know. It's really the I, second book. I Yeah, so my, my second book, I've been teaching about anti-Semitism for years. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, yeah, my so my my book though, yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's more it's, recent. I mean, because yeah, we've all kind of had to become even more expert in different aspects of anti-Semitism as it's been on the rise and as we've been wanting to respond and, you know, support our students and respond um, to the things that are going on in the world, right? And they keep happening, right? Just like Professor from said, even this summer, I mean, this summer, this weekend, <laughs> um, you know, these, these you know, groups in, in um, Florida is just, is ongoing. So anyway, I've said enough. Yeah, you're this question is from Erica Danzig, I think for um, Professor Fabiglish, and then we also have some a couple questions on the Roma um, for you, Professor Bachik, but let's first um, for uh, Kirsten about that initial question that your friends and family were, were asking you to do, which is the influence um, of Jim Crow and so forth in the US on Nazi Germany, if you can elaborate a little bit on that. I didn't prepare that. Um, I um, so it's actually funny because I thought I would just throw it out there so that then people wouldn't remind me of it. Um, so I mean, you know, there definitely was, you know, Ford and Henry Ford, who was kind of a very prominent, uh, you know, uh, proponent of anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, had impact on Hitler, um, Nazis, I, I, I apologize, I don't have the, the details at my fingertips, so I'm not going to do a great job of elaborating on it, but definitely the Nazis were um, admiring of American eugenics, right? So the eugenics movement in the United States was very elaborate, you know, sort of ideas about um, racial science were very elaborated here in the eugenics movement, and Nazis, and actually maybe Amy can speak to this better than I can, actually. Um, you know, they absolutely were using kind of the racial science that's being developed here as, as part of elaborating their system. Um, and my understanding is that they also sort of saw Jim Crow as a legitimizing factor and also as sort of a way of thinking about segregation. But maybe I'll let maybe I'll let Dr. Simon do more since that's maybe more of her her bailiwick. You know, definitely. And actually, this is, there's a book that came out a few years ago called Hitler's um, American model um, by a political scientist in um, at Princeton. And it's just, you know, it's the things that I had always heard about a little bit here and there encapsulated in a book that's all about the, you know, the, with the primary source evidence of these Nazi leaders, like many of them getting together and using the actual, yeah, race laws in the United States as their direct model for how to treat Jews in Nazi Germany. Like it's, it's very clear, it's very convincing. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just right there. So yeah, especially with definitely the racial science, right? We were we were sterilizing people in Indiana before they were sterilizing them in Nazi Germany, um, just general eugenics and race law, but then, I mean, and um, we, uh, yeah, racial hygiene, race science, but then also um, Jim Crow and they, yeah, they very much lauded us. They would have loved to have uh, allied with us and created a nice, you know, white, supremacist uh, world, but we had other other plans, so. Okay, so we have one uh, question from Avi Cohen about, um, can you try to compare and contrast whether um, Jews were also sterilized like the Roma or compare contrast to what extent um, the two communities were registered um, and the registration process um, for those? Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess that's for you, um, well, for I, for both uh, Amy Simon and Anna Brockick, if you can speak to that. Yeah, yes, it would be great. So I don't um, know a lot of these details and it's hard to, to, you know, to compare. I think there's a fundamental difference between 
having a strategic decision to murder outright and a strategic decision to sterilize instead. And so I think, you know, um, it, that, that is difficult to answer. What I can speak to is to the efforts of registration afterwards, um, which is that, you know, the Swedish example is an interesting example because um, you may have noticed during my, my remarks that I really didn't talk about numbers much. And the reason for that is because we don't have numbers uh, on Roma populations. And um, that's because, uh, you know, data collection efforts resulted in terrible crimes. And so today, uh, many Romani communities or many members of Romani communities in Europe won't um, ident self identify as Roma for census purposes, right? And so, uh, with the express purpose of, of trying to evade such efforts at registration. And so, this is, you know, something that I didn't mention before, but I think is important to know today, right? As another um, long term consequence of what happened. Um, I don't know, Dr. Simon, do you want to uh, supplement my answer? Oops. Yeah, not, I mean, not really, obviously. I mean, you did a good job. I think that, yeah, it's just two different projects. And um, like I said, I think because Jews were really central to the project of, of Nazism, they just wanted to kill them. I mean, there was no place really for sterilization. It, it didn't. Yeah, um, it was too slow. <laughs> um, and I feel like with the Roma, there was like this fascination as well as the hostility. And so they were studying them at the same time that they were trying to, you know, get rid of them. And so, you know, that's me. I'm not saying it's ambivalent. It's still genocide. And like you said, delayed genocide. But they wanted to study them in the meantime. So, yeah, I don't know, just kind of different mentality behind it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll maybe collect um, some of the questions here and, and give you each, you know, at least one. So for you, um, Dr. Brackick, there's a question as to whether, the rec whether you think the recognition of the, uh, the Romani genocide um, impacted how we talked and viewed the um, Bosnian genocide. And maybe then for you, um, Dr. Simon, um, there's a question um, as to whether the huge population reduction in Poland that you talked about and, uh, and showed in the statistics and the map, whether it was mainly due to the extermination or whether people also fled out of fear of history repeating itself. Um, and then uh, there's two, uh, uh, well, I'll give one more question. I'll put that out there. Um, um, just, you know, so, you know, you can think about all, all three. And this question was about normal F Norman Finkelstein and how he has said that the Holocaust and anti-Semitism have been weaponized for the interests of Israel. And so what do you think about his, um, you know, uh, the conveying of his, of the sentiment by Norman Finkelstein. Um, so, uh, Maybe um, Dr. Brackett, do you want to go first about whether kind of a recognition of the Roma experience informed how we perceive the Bosnian? I think perhaps. I think, you know, the less we recognize genocides or, you know, as some prefer to call them genocidal killings, the more we become inured to them, you know, and, and this is a particularly difficult one, right? Because people like to say never again. And yet in the case of Roma, um, majorities kept, you know, engaging in some actions that were essentially identical, perhaps not at the same scale, right? But, but nevertheless that happened. So I think it perhaps did have an influence, right? But I think maybe we should look at this a little bit more broadly and look at other places and other genocides that are also not seen, right? And perhaps if, there were an effort in, you know, recognizing more, um, then we would be better at noting and then, you know, fighting against um, other genocides as well. It's hard for me to say that it's, you know, not really seeing this one in particular, but I think it's, it's, it's a bigger question. I, I think there is a lot of truth to it. And, and 
Dr. Simon about the, you know, why there are hardly any Jews in Poland anymore. Yeah, so I actually, I also typed out an answer to that because I know we're coming to the end of our time. But yes, um, most Polish Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Um, it's upwards of 80% of Polish Jews were killed. Um, but then there were others who fled uh, east into Russia, survived in gulags and in the Russian camps and, and survived that way. Um, there were others who went back home and faced um, outright hostility, including um, violence and murder, and so uh, were dissuaded um, from staying in Poland. Um, and then for those who did stay, um, by 1968, there was growing anti-Semitism in, um, in, in Poland, in, in um, the Soviet Union, in communist circles, and Jews. It was an anti-Jewish campaign to basically force Jews to leave Poland at that time, and they did. Um, so, yeah, there are very few Jews in Poland now. And so, okay, so they'll, I'll collect the two last questions that we have, and then we'll probably have to wrap it up there, right? So that, so the, the question from someone was the contention that Normal Finkelstein says that the Holocaust and anti-Semitism are weaponized for the interests of Israel. And then there's another question about um, what, you know, what we've been reading about um, this week. Um, um, what would you say to Whoopi Goldberg and how could you use this as a teachable moment? Um, <laughs> see, when you get into contemporary issues, uh, you get all kinds of questions that you can't answer. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, I, um, the, I mean, I, I don't really wanna, I would say that, The existence of anti-Semitism and the impact of the Holocaust are things that are real, um, and certainly they can be used for political purposes. But they are also, you know, the Holocaust had a major emotional impact on American Jews, and they chose to create art and literature out of it, and to talk about it, and to think about it, and to read about it. So, to see it as weaponizing for a political purpose. I, I, it just, it's very problematic. I, I'm not sure whether the person wants me to criticize, I, I'm not sure what the nature of the question is, but it seems to me a very sort of simplistic and problematic formulation. Um, uh, um, and in terms of the, remind me of the other question, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to answer that one and there's something else I can answer. And this is for you um, or Amy or both of you, um, uh, you know, what would you say to, uh, uh, Whoopi Goldberg and how could you make this a teaching moment, you know, the fact that she hadn't seen the Holocaust in terms of race. And then we'll give our last question actually to Michael Serling. I think I, I think he, I see his hand up. So so first the Whoopi Goldberg question. I mean, I think I think Dr. Simon is probably a better person to answer this than I am. So I'm, I'm going to send it over to you. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think I explained it pretty pretty clearly, at least in my own mind, of like how it was about race. Um, so I would, you know, allow, I would accept her conception that I think a lot of Americans have of Jews as white. I mean, there are other issues with it, but, you know, that is a very common conception. Um, as, you know, generally true, Jews in America have, white appearing Jews in America have privileged, have been privileged and, and um, been able to take advantage of that whiteness, but to remind her that um, two things. First, that this was not the case in Nazi Germany. Like, it's just not, it just wasn't true. It's not true that Jews that were considered white at that time, the end. But then the second part of it's even more important, and it gets to what Professor from English has already been talking about, that Jews remain the center of this conspiracy theory. And this actually just happened in Utah. There was a very, I gave a interview about it. There was a very famous, uh, very important Utah um, businessman who wrote this like really ludicrous email to his um, constituents, like his, um, I don't know, his constituents about um, how COVID is all a Jewish ploy to like undermine Christian world and destroy everything. And that's the same thing like with the Turner Diaries, like the idea that the Jews are the ones pulling the strings or the puppet masters behind the blacks, behind the, you know, whoever your other group is that you don't like, that the Jews are at the center of that. So I don't, you know, you can't take that away. For, for white supremacists, Jews are not white. They never will be. Um, so they, they may appear white to other people and to black communities, it makes a lot of sense, but 
in that world, um, Jews are not white. I, and I just want to actually follow up by sort of saying that the other thing to sort of think about is that um, it, that race is both, you know, imagine people are constructed as races, right? None of this is real, right? Just in, in America, right? Blackness feels real. And in fact, people are treated in that way, right? In the same way that when Jews are treated as a distinct race, when they are separated out, and murdered or when they you know are separated out and and not allowed to get jobs or or taken into schools that is a meaningful category right and i think that that's something that i would you know if i had Whoopi goldberg you know in my class we would talk more about that and hopefully try to understand both the unreality of it right and and then the process of making it real right the ways in which it is real it becomes real and meaningful um so both of those things are really necessary i think to understand that I want to also say, say something about Norman Finkelstein because um, I just want to say, first of all, he is um, he wrote the uh, this book called The Holocaust Industry. So his arguments are about um, the Holocaust uh, being weaponized uh, uh, and anti-Semitism being weaponized um, for support for the state of Israel, as well as um, being exploited um, for money, for gain. That basically the Jews, although he is Jewish and has survivor parents, but that doesn't mean that he might not have um, you know perspective that um, is I would say flawed, um, you know that that um, yeah the Jews basically exploit the Holocaust for money. To all of those things, I would say that um, there, yes, a person could do those things. Yes, there have been people that do those things, but that is not the core of what's going on when we talk about the Holocaust. When we talk about um, anti-Semitism. No, you know, uh, you can't, you can't exaggerate what happened during the Holocaust. You can't exaggerate the trauma and whatever you do with it afterwards, uh, will never make up for it, right? Israel doesn't make up for the Holocaust. Um, nothing makes up for that, just complete loss. And so, um, so yeah, of course there can be people that do all kinds of nefarious things that you don't like, but as a whole, there's not like a conspiracy because it sounds again like conspiracy of like Jews to take advantage and to get something out of you know being victims and to push people aside and it's just not right it's just not accurate that's not what Jews are doing um and yeah so that's what I'll say about that yeah it's kind of uh hurtful and wounding to to, to hear that um that claim by Finkelstein uh, and the vast majority of Jews find it kind of despicable. Um, so, Michael Serling, I will give you the the last uh, question. Um, oh no, well, we have two more. So, Lauren uh, Harris, after you. Um, so, uh, go ahead, Michael. So, uh, do you think that America, being so much of a melting pot and so different? from let's say Germany or Poland or Hungary uh, that because of the tremendous amount of people in America from other places, uh, so many minorities, that the situation is far different than what happened in Europe uh, in the 30s and 40s? Um. You know, I think that I certainly talk with my students at the beginning of a semester in American Jewish history about the ways that, um, you know, the, the presence of many peoples, I would say particularly many peoples of color um, and the ways that uh, Blacks and uh, Indigenous people in the United States sort of formed, um, you know, an other that, that could be, uh, treated violently, enslaved, um, objects of genocide, that, that displaced and sort of, you know, made the United States different, right? Um, a, a different sort of place where they would be sort of seen, perceived of and used, sort of seen politically differently. Um, you know, I, 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 I hesitate. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question simply because I think that I'm just so anxious about some of the things happening now that I think I thought would never happen in the United States and that a lot of American historians and a lot of American Jewish historians didn't think would happen in the United States. And so 
I'm really uncomfortable with saying that sort of the natural demographics of the US kind of make this impossible because I just don't feel comfortable saying that anymore. Um, I, I do think that the sort of the notion of racial, sort of what race means in the United States looks different. And so that that has been different. And that's the one reason why anti-Semitism looks different, but I wouldn't want to go any further than that. So um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to add, but that's, that's my own perception right now. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. That's um, that's certainly things that we're seeing now that we none of us have ever seen before. Yeah, it's it's really uh, disheartening and surprising in many ways to all of us. Um, and we're doing so much. I think we're doing three workshops on anti-Semitism and three different colleges in the next month. And and Pearson and Amy, I just participated with Mohammed Khalil and Morgan Shipley and doing a training for 320 residential advisors on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So I saw, I keep saying the last question, the last question, so now truly the last two questions and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, so one question, I think uh, I think my friends uh, would appreciate me taking from, from Lauren Harris about anti-Semitism from the left, BDS and, and Jewish Voices for Peace and whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, you take that one. <laughs> so, um, so we're, you know, we've been kind of talking through these things and the guide we're completing on anti-Semitism and some of these are, you know, difficult questions. Um, and so there are many Jews um, who equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Um, and that's a very common view. Um, we in our guide are not equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Um, because you know you could have um, uh, people who are against all nationalisms and nation states, um, are against self determination for all peoples, have a particular kind of um, reason. You know, if you, you have a particular Palestinian experience um, in 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 uh, Palestine and so forth for for one's uh, anti Zionism, and of course, not all Jews at all times have been Zionists. However, right, um, I think that does also does not mean that if you're anti-Zionist, you're automatically exempt <laughs> from being anti-Semitic. And so if you're anti-Zionist, it doesn't mean you are anti-Semitic, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that you're automatically not, right? And so I think we're saying that there are questions that can be asked. So for instance, are Jews the only people um, who you think um, do not deserve self-determination, if Jews are the only people, right, then that raises questions, right? Why are Jews the only people if one thinks that other peoples do deserve it? Um, uh, and certainly, you know, uh, with BDS, um, there are many supporters of BDS um, who are not anti-Semitic um, and are against, you know, um, the occupation in the West Bank and so forth. Um, that being said, sometimes there's rhetoric that's used that uses anti-Semitic tropes, and then it can be anti-Semitic. Um, and again, you know, it de you know it depends on, um, you know, I think more questions have to be asked. Um, I just heard from my son, who's a student at University of Chicago today, that he had a, a snap, you know, one of these social medias, <laughs> Instagram, I think, where students for. Jewish Voices for Peace on their campus were trying to ban any course on Israel and any Israeli visitor from teaching at the university. Um, you know, that's part of a boycott, um, uh, you know, and that could be, um, you know, we think problematic, right? Part of a university's job is academic freedom of listening to and learning about the histories of different countries as we do for China and Russia and Syria and, and uh, in so many countries around the world, um, and you do that in a complex, critical fashion. You don't ban countries from being studied <laughs> at universities, but um, there could be a whole conversation of what, what, what elements of it under what conditions can be anti-Semitic. So th those are all more complex issues, um, but they certainly raise, um, raise uh, you know, a lot of questions, as Professor Simon's saying, in terms of is, you know, the climate for Jewish students and sometimes faculty and staff. So even when something is not anti-Semitic, it can certainly affect a climate of inclusion, right? When those things are, are being banned. Um, so yeah, 
so uh, I think, oh, we had one last question uh, and that um, maybe I'll, I'll give to Professor from English or Professor Simon, which is, um, you know, if you have black Jews, which of course you do, you know, Ethiopian Jews, other black Jews in the United States, we had a, a lecture on that in the fall, um, then doesn't necessarily mean that you also have white Jews and don't, um, isn't the experience of black Jews unique in terms of the kinds of things that they're facing and dealing uh, with. So again, it, it, it gets to the issue of how Jews fit uh, um, with, with kind of the racial uh, categories that we have in the United States and whether, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, absolutely. Like, I, I don't know about unique, but for sure, I mean, someone who is both Black and Jewish is is dealing with anti-Semitism and also anti-Black racism and is being differently racialized, being sort of seen as, as a racial, in, in different racial categories that are going to impact in, in um, sort of doubly in and multiple ways. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's definitely something for um, for historians and for, for people in general to think about when they think about Jews and whiteness, right? Is that not every Jew, Jews are not all white. Um, and so there needs to be a lot of um, sort of careful thinking about what we talk about when we talk about Jews and white privilege in the United States. Um, it, it is there for people who are white presenting for sure, um, but it is not there for people who are not. Um, and so there needs to be a lot more sort of thought and attention paid to that by everyone. Um, so I appreciate that question for sure. And I would say also, I mean, as we learned in the lecture with Bruce Haynes last semester, um, he's written a great book about uh, Jews who are also Black in all kinds of different communities and from different places and with different identities in the United States, um, is that also Black Jews can face um, the gamut of, you know, uh, microaggressions to outright hostility within Jewish, generally white presenting circles, generally Ashkenazi circles, um, and so there's that other side of it that um, it can be very, very difficult for Black Jews, aside from the outside community, um, also within. So yeah, um, definitely, like Professor Vermiglis said, things that we need to keep learning about and studying and trying to work to um, improve, even within Jewish communities. Right. And then we have what was mentioned before, too, is even for white Jews, they enjoy aspects of white privilege, certainly today, and not necessarily all historically, as, as, as uh, Professor Vermeer was pointed out, but they can also be killed, right, um, for being uh, Jewish by white nationalists, as happened in the Chief Life Synagogue and so forth. So um, so you have this more complex <laughs> issue of, of race. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you for three um, fantastic speakers and for your enlightening lectures and for great questions. And please join us again on, on uh, February 22nd uh, to learn more about kind of uh, all the massacres that led up to um, the Holocaust and learn more about, you know, uh, how you, how, how the, what the progression was and how it can, might be, we learn from it to prevent it at earlier stages. So um, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.